Okay, good morning, everybody, and Hazak Badu. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Thursday morning as we are heading into the beautiful, amazing holiday of Shavuot, my friends. And may Hashem bless us on this holiday and all holidays with all the beautiful blessings of each and every single Hag. Of course, we can't just walk into the holiday. We have to prepare for the holiday. And of course, we do. We are. Here we are preparing for Hag Shavuot. Today's class is sponsored anonymously. For the Rifu'a Shilma of all of Israel, today's class is also Lelun Nishmat Moshe Dabach Moshe Ben Gilsom, sponsored by his wife, Yvette, and children. Ruach Hashem Tani Hainu, Beganet El Hubechol Ben Eisel Hashachvim Emo, Bichlar Hamid Basilichot, Vechen Yi Ratzon, Venomar Amen. Rabotai, there are many ideas, many interesting things to speak about on this fantastic holiday of Shavuot. Where to begin with so little time and so much to talk about? So, I guess let's talk about the names of the holiday a little bit. We know that the Hag, the holiday of Shavuot, has different names. Okay, it's called Hag HaShavuot. It's called Hag HaKatsir. It's called also Yom HaBikurim. Okay, the day of bringing the first fruits. There is another name that's given to it by the rabbis. Okay, the rabbis came and they added a name. And again, we're going to try to talk a little about different points because there's a lot to talk about. And we only have today and tomorrow to prepare for the holiday. What is um, the, the rabbis, they add another name. Anyone know what that name is to the Hag, to the holiday? Besides the names the Torah gives it, of again, Shavuot and Katsir, which means of reaping or harvesting, um, and uh, Bikurim. It's also given the name by the rabbis of Hag Atzeret. Okay, it's used as an example in the Mishnah, Masech Rosh right in the first chapter. Okay, it's called Atzeret. Atzeret, what does it mean? And, and why are the rabbis giving it that new name? Are three names not enough? Atzeret means to stop. Okay? La Atzor. If you, if, you stop, if you live in Israel, you'll see on the corner, there's a red uh, octagon-shaped sign. And it says, Atzor in America, stop. Okay? Atzeret means to stop. Okay? And that's a very, I guess, appropriate name because we are stopping. We are stopping what we're doing, and we are not doing any work, okay? Actually, <laughs> if you think about the holiday of Shavuot, there is nothing to the holiday that, that differentiates it from another day of the week. Today, at least, we don't have korbanot. We don't have anything. How would you know what marks Shavuot different than the day that follows it of Tuesday and Wednesday? It's no different. The only difference is that you're atzor, that you're stopping. If not for that, I wouldn't know that it's a holiday, I don't have a lulav to shake. I don't have a sukkah to sit in. I don't have a shofar to listen to. I don't have matzah to eat. Okay, Shavuot. So today, and then 500 years ago, we also were introduced to the idea of staying up all night. Okay, so those are relatively new things. But it, in its truest form, if you go back 2,000 years, minusing the korbanot, which we don't have anymore, how would you know today's a holiday? If not for the fact that you had to stop so Atzor is a very appropriate name for the Hag, for the holiday. Okay, but maybe, my friends, there is a deeper idea to this name of Atzeret, okay? There's a deeper name, and I'm sharing with you today thoughts from, take a guess, very good, okay? Rabbi Bernstein, the call of Sinai, my friends. If you don't have it, what are you waiting for? Jump on, fantastic ideas. It's not too late. I know the holidays in two days. You can read it over Shabbat as well. You can read it over on Sunday. And it's an amazing, amazing, amazing work. He notices, he points out differences between the holiday of Shavuot and its sister holidays. What are the sister holidays of Shavuot? Pesach and Sukkot. Those are the Shalosh Regalim, the three festival, three pilgrimages. And we know right away, I want you to think of differences that uh, we know between Pesach and Shavuot. Difference number one is that the other two holidays of Pesach and Sukkot had a date, the 15th actually, of that month. 15th of Nisan, 15th of Tishrei, the Tishri, okay, if you're Sfaradi, okay. Uh, but if you are Shavuot, you don't have a date. No dates. When is Shavuot celebrated? It's actually 50 days from Pesach. Actually, now it's on a set calendar, it's always going to be like the song suggests, Shesh Besivan Bonatan Hatora Le Israel. 
Okay? Shesh besivan. That's today. But when we had a month based on the moon and the witnesses coming to Bedid to testify that they saw the new moon, you had some months, some years, excuse me, that Shavuot would fall out on the 5th, and you would have years that Shavuot would fall out on the 7th. Okay? It wouldn't always fall out on the 6th. 5, 6, 7. So that's difference number one. Pesach and Sukkot always have the same date of the year. Shavuot, no such date. It has nothing to do with the date. It has to do with counting 50 days from the date of Pesach. Difference number two. Unlike Pesach and Sukkot, how many days do we celebrate those holidays for? Those are seven-day holidays. Shavuot is one day. And what is going on over here? And because of these two questions, some commentaries suggest, my friends, that actually Shavuot should not be viewed as its own holiday, but rather as a culmination and a conclusion to the holiday of Pesach. You see, Shavuot, really, we're going to see in a minute that other commentaries say this, but Shavuot is very similar to the last day of Sukkot. What the last day of Sukkot called? We have Sukkot, seven days, and then the last day is called Shemini Atzeret. Ah, the eighth day you stop. And our rabbis are trying to give us that message by calling Shavuot also the eighth day to stop. Not eighth, but Atzeret, because you're counting seven weeks. And then as we're beginning the eighth week, so to speak, it's the Shemini Atzeret of Shavuot. So there's two Shemini Atzeret in the year, in a way. There's the OG Shemini Atzeret right after Sukkot. And then there's the Atzeret that we have right here in the holiday of Shavuot. And Shavuot is the ending, it's the conclusion, it's the sequel to Pesach. Just like you have Sukkot, seven days, Shemini Atzeret. So do you have Pesach, seven weeks, and Shavuot. Actually, the Ramban writes this explicitly. And the Ramban, when he speaks about the Omer, he says that these days should be treated as a Chol HaMoed. The same way you have six days of holiness in between Sukkot and Shemini Atzeret. You have the holy days of Chol HaMoed. They're not just regular weekdays. I know we forget sometimes. We treat them like a regular day. We go to Six Flags and we... Okay, but there actually there are laws, believe it or not, to Chol HaMoed. It's not a full weekday. It's higher than a weekday. These weeks of the Omer carry with them the Chol HaMoed status according to the Ramban. Again, not halachically. Of course, you could work. But in Kedusha-wise, Kedusha-wise. And therefore, the Omer, we should realize, is not just a period counting towards Shavuot, but it's actually connecting Pesach and Shavuot. And there's a fascinating Midrash, my friends, that actually says this again explicitly. Take a look at the Midrash. I'll read it to you. He quotes it here in English. But if you're taking notes, it's in Shira Shirim Rabbah, chapter 7, uh, I guess, uh, verse 4. Amar Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, says Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. You, listen to this, it's going to blow your mind, listen to this. It would have been more appropriate for Shemini Atzeret to have taken place 50 days after Sukkot. Why would that be more appropriate? Says the Midrash, just as the case is with Shavuot after Pesach. The same way Shavuot is 50 days after Pesach, it should have been the same that Shemini Atzeret should be 50 days after Sukkot. And why is it not? Because of the rainy season, the rabbis had pity, Hashem had pity not to make you come in in the dead of the winter again on Shemini Atzeret. So we let you come in instead seven days later. We gave you a miniature version of 50, which is seven. Right? Instead of seven weeks, we let you come in after seven days. Once you're here, we'll just, we'll just, we'll do you the favor. But isn't this unbelievable? You hear what the Midrash is saying? The Midrash is actually telling us <laughs> that the right way is to be 50 days later. Ours is the OG. Atzeret of Shavuot is the real uh, culmination. 50 days is really what you need. Okay, we, we did you a favor back there. But the Midrash is telling you hands on, explicitly, that Shavuot and Pesach are intertwined. One is the culmination of the other. So I think we have over here uh, enough proof that Shavuot is, again, a continuation of Pesach. But the question is, okay, what does that mean? 
In what way are they connected? I got it. They are connected. You prove that they're connected. But why are they connected? How are they connected? And the answer is, Pesach, we know, is all about freedom. Freedom, my friends, is not, in, Jude in, Jewish, in Judaism's eyes, a goal. Freedom is not the end. Freedom, we have to realize, is a means to an end. Freedom is something that's nice, but what is it? Define freedom. If your definition of freedom is, I'm not a slave, then it's a negative definition. You have still yet to describe what it is. What is it? It's, you describe what it's not. But does it have an identity? Does freedom have a positive aspect to it? When we left Misraim, we didn't just say we're not slaves to Paro. That's just, again, very passive definition. It's not enough to describe, okay, so you're not. You told me what you're not. But what are you? Freedom is not a goal in itself. Freedom is so that now I am free to use my time in now doing something that I want to do. When I was a slave, my time was controlled by somebody else. Now my time is mine, and I can do what I like with it. Well, what am I going to do in my time as Jews? Shav uh, Pesach continues into Shavuot. Shavuot is the conclusion of Pesach, meaning the goal of Pesach, the goal of freedom, is so that we can not just be not slaves to Paro, but so that we can, yes, be servants of Hashem. Hallelujah, hallelujah, avde Hashem. We are now servants to God. Shavuot is the beautiful conclusion. It's the sequel to Pesach, meaning I'm free and therefore now I can serve Hashem. When we got the Ten Commandments, the first commandment, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am God. Who took you out of Egypt, says the Gaon Mevilna. That's not talking about who took you out of Egypt 50 days ago. Says the Gaon, I took you out just now. Because just now on Shavuot was the freedom actually realized. Now you know why you were free. Now that you got the Torah, your freedom has purpose. Freedom, my friends, needs to be directed. You know, you look at America, you look at the world that we live in, unfortunately, when there's too much free time, freedom can be very dangerous if it's not, again, directed, if it's not aimed. We also, the tragic incident that happened just a week ago, where a teenage boy had too much free time. When you have free time, and all day long you're playing violent video games and your entertainment is violence and you have free time to now just go out and think about doing crazy things and two dozen people almost have to be the, the victim of your free time. So freedom is not a good thing in itself. To give people time, you know, look at your phones, see how much time you spent on what you're spending it. Just to have time and technology Gave us a big bracha, but it also could be the cause of a kelala. To have technology which is going to do everything quickly. And instead of having to go out into the fields and reap and harvest, we have a lot of free time now. Washing machines and, and uh, ovens and food and Uber Eats and everything you like. Okay, but do we have, are we guiding? And are we directing our free time? Our time, if not directed be very, very dangerous. And that is what Shavuot is all about. Shavuot, when we say it's Atzeret, the rabbis are trying to remind us, remember, just like Shemini Atzeret, it's the continuation of Sukkot. Atzeret, it's the continuation of freedom. Don't allow time to just be used. In the words of Rav Hirsch, my friends, the Goyim count towards freedom. The Jews count from freedom. The Goyim count towards the day of Freedom of July 4th. That's the goal. Now we are free. Da -da, right? But for Jews, freedom is not something that counted, that's counted towards, but something that, that's counted from. We count from freedom. We start counting. Now we can start preparing for Shavuot. How beautiful is that? So that I think is one idea. Write it down. Shavuot, again, and again, maybe that's the name of the, the meaning of the name Shavuot. It's not just... Uh, that we're following seven weeks, so we call the holiday weeks. But it's saying that the conclusion of the period of the weeks that we were just in, this is it. Shavuot is the culmination. Shavuot is the goal of all of those weeks that we were counting from Pesach. Beautiful. So that's one idea 
on this holiday. Moving on to the next, we know that there's a lot of uh, customs, many customs in regards to having greenery and flowers and trees. As an example, the Shulchan Aruch writes, let's open it up, Siman, okay, I could open it up quickly. Okay, let's open it up quickly to, uh, it's going to be Taf <clears throat> Tzadi Gima. So let's open it up. Here we go. Rama writes, Sorry, it's Taf Tzadi Dalit, okay? Rama writes, Nohagin lishtoach asavim b'shavuot. It is customary to spread out greenery, esev is grass, on shavuot, bebet ha-keneset v'habatim, zecher lesimhat matan Torah. In memory of the giving of the Torah. Okay, so that is one custom of spreading out uh, grass on in the houses, so make sure everybody you call your local florist. Okay, I hope I'm getting commission on this one, and order from them a lot of flowers and nice greenery for your house. Decorate your house and your sh your shul, your synagogues, with beautiful green flowers and trees, etc. So let's talk a little bit about this custom, and then we'll read the next line for the next custom. Okay. What is, the, what is the meaning to commemorate Matan Torah? Why is green remembering Matan Torah? If I, were, if I were to ask you, if there's one thing that I should do to decorate my house, to remember Matan Torah, please, what, what would it be? I would say maybe bring in a lot of dirt for the desert. I don't know, sand. I don't know what you're doing. Sorry, what's this? Okay, write it down. Okay, um, what, why specifically uh, uh, grass? Why grass? Okay, oh, yeah. lightning. Maybe you should bring some lightning into your house, some rain. Okay, why specifically grass? So, for simplest reason, the Levush says that if you look in the Torah, the Pasuk, when God gave the Torah to Moshe, he said, warn the people not to come up, right? And make sure that these sheep also don't graze. The cattle should not graze when I'm giving the Torah. So, ah, so you see that there was grass. Isn't that interesting? You're in the desert, you're in the wilderness. Why is there grass over there? So that's a miracle that happened. So to remember the beautiful miracle of the grass that was on Har Sinai to beautify the mountain. Anyone that ever went sightseeing, it's not the same if you see a brown mountain or if you see a beautiful mountain with green and maybe white capped, you know, uh, right, t tops. So, this explanation is an interesting explanation, very simple, straightforward. That's why you put grass. According to this explanation, by the way, it would seem that you should put specifically grass or reeds or greenery, right? As opposed to, like pasture, as opposed to flowers. Where does flowers come from? So the flowers actually comes from a, um, a different source, Midrash Talpiyot. The Gemara says, Every single uh, utterance that emerged from God's mouth, the world was filled with a aroma. Okay, I got a complaint yesterday from my doorman. He says, uh, you know, your neighbors are complaining that you're, uh, the, you're, you're keeping your door open on Shabbat. Your hallway is getting filled with an odor. <laughs> okay, I guess... They're smelling the lahmajin and the chillant. So uh, what I wanted to tell him was, dude, it's not an odor, it's an aroma. <laughs> but okay, I didn't know if he would appreciate that. So I, you know, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to keep my door closed. I apologize, etc. An aroma is a beautiful, nice smelling item, right? So every word that God says was accompanied with an aroma. Why, why was that miracle necessary? What exactly is that trying to indicate? An aroma accompanying every commandment given by God. An aroma, my friends, uh, elevates the mood, right? As an example, on Saturday night, what do we do? Besamim, 
Why? Because it's the only thing that could actually, it's the only physical thing that could penetrate to the neshama, to the soul. A nice smell elevates the mood. Right? Why do people put uh, cologne and perfume? People spend a lot of money on that stuff. Why? Because uh, if people smell that I'm nice, it's that they like me. Right? Right? So an aroma is to help elevate. So we have to realize that the Torah is the same thing. Torah is not just meant to be studied. Torah is something that should put us in a better mood. The Torah cannot only affect the mind, but the Torah must also penetrate the heart, the emotions of a person. Something we've spoken about in the past. The Torah is not just an intellectual pursuit or exercise. Torah is something that's to be studied, and it has to be studied by Simha, and it's supposed to be like when I'm finding treasures, I'm so excited. When I learn Torah, I have to be in a better mood than how I was before. Okay. That is another reason that's given. There is a third idea of here, and that is uh, that actually the custom is, by the way, if I could just share with you another fantastic Midrash based on the story in Purim. Haman, the Midrash says, was trying to talk slander to Ahasuerus about the Jewish people. So what does he tell him? He tells him how all the holidays, how every time, excuse me, the Goyim are gathering together and working for the government, whenever there's, you know, just events or functions, etc., the Jews are always waving the get out of jail free card. Ah, I can't come today, it's uh, Pesach. I can't come today, it's Shavuot. I can't come today, it's Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, da 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 da, right? <laughs> I'm sure everyone here that's working knows in, in uh, I, can't, I can't speak, I work on the holidays. But people that keep Shabbat and Yom Tov, okay, um, I'm sure you know when it comes to the month of September, your boss is probably very fed up. You know, do you plan on coming to work at all this month? Like, you know, what's going on? You got Rosh Hashanah and then, then Shabbat and then Kippur and then Shabbat and then Sukkot and then da 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 da. The whole month is gone. So, uh, Haman, it started with him. Haman actually started with, with this gossip. He says to Ahasuerus, you know, every time there's a holiday, the Jews are MIA. Anytime we're doing stuff for the government, the Jews claim that they have a holiday. Can't do anything. Can't work for you. And look what he says. When it comes to, he ha, he describes how each festival and the practice during those festivals was done as a rejection to one of the king's rules. So as an example, when it came to the holiday of Shavuot, look what he says. They go to the synagogues. They read the Shema. They pray. They read from the Torah and the prophets. They curse the king and his ministers. Then they ascend to the roof of their synagogues and spread out flowers. This is Haman talking about what he witnessed in the Jewish synagogues on the holiday of Shavuot. They spread out flowers. They gather up and they say the same way we gathered all the flowers, may Hashem gather these Gentile sons and kill them from being amongst our midst. This is the gossip that Haman told Achashverosh. But what do you see from here? The gossip part is not true. But you see that he relates and he he uh, he connects the idea of flowers to the holiday of Shavuot. So very interesting to see again how in our literature, how far back these customs go. So there's grass, there's flowers, there's even a third variation to the custom based on in the Magen of Raham, a commentary on the Rama, on the Shulchan Aruch. And he says that the custom is actually to place trees on Shavuot. So not flowers, not beautiful plant, but trees. Now you can imagine the Gaon Mevilna abolished this decree. Take a guess why. Okay? When you think of a tree, what do you think of? Right? You think of the Goyim's holiday. So the Gaon Mevilna said no trees in the shul because it's going in the ways of the Goyim. It's violating the Chukot HaGoyim. You're not allowed to walk in the ways of the non-Jews. Okay, so no trees. But uh, others argue and say it is okay. It's only a problem to copy the Goyim when we're copying them without a reason. But when we have a reason and a source to our tradition, just because the goyim also do it, doesn't ruin and have to, you know, sabotage our plans of, of that tradition. Okay, so either way, machloket, trees, yes trees, no trees. But I want to share with you one more idea on this idea of having green uh, and trees uh, of what, where does the custom originate from? The custom, according to one final idea, Rabbi Bernstein quotes over here, Rabbi Mordechai Banit, <clears throat> Qu uh, quoted as well in the Pardes Yosef. 
In the beginning of Shemot, the Torah tells us that Moshe was born. Anyone know Moshe's uh, birthday? Moshe's birthday, according to our tradition, is the 7th of Adar. Okay? Now hold on to that date. It's going to be an important date. You're going to need to know that in a few minutes. Moshe was born, and the Torah tells us that his mother, actually he was born three months early. So his mother was able to hide him from the Egyptian taskmasters, because they, they kept a tally, they kept track of who's due when, and they would come into the house, and they would make sure that the baby was aborted. So Moshe, miraculously, was born three months earlier. So the taskmasters didn't come to the house. It's, she's not due yet. She's still uh, PG, okay? Finally, on the due date, she realized she can't hold him anymore. She's going to she's gonna have to either abort him, like when they come in, or she has to get rid of him. So she puts him, we know, in a basket, and she puts him in the Yam Suf, in the little uh, sea of reeds, in the Nile, which was fill, uh, right among the reeds of the banks of the Nile. And eventually, he makes his way to uh, Batya's palace, and she raises him, and he becomes Moshe Rabbeinu. Okay? Now, the Midrash tells us that when he was in the sea, naturally, it should have sunk. Okay? The angels come before Hashem, and they said, Master of the world, shall the one who is destined to receive the Torah from Har Sinai on this day be killed on this day? The angels are coming here to protect Moshe, and they say, God, what's today's date? Three months from Zayin Adar, 6th of Sivan. Oh, look at that. The 6th of Sivan is not only the day the Torah was given, but it's the day that Moshe Rabbeinu was saved in the basket. And the angel said, God, you're going to kill this man on this day, the very day that he's going to bring down the Torah in 80 years from now? And God said, you're right. And Hashem allowed His mercy to overcome His deen, His justice, and He saved Moshe's life. And it's for this reason that we have green. Nothing to do with Har Sinai. You know why we have green? Because a big miracle happened on this day. 80 years before Har Sinai, the miracle that took place with the reeds at the Nile River. And to remember those reeds, we have green on Shavuot. Nothing to do with Matan Torah. Wow. Okay, did you get that? That's fantastic stuff, okay? Okay, so this is really cool. But let's move along, okay? We can't... Uh, we can't bask too much in this. We have a lot to talk about. Let's move on now to the final idea for today's Chiyud. And that is the continuation of the Ramah's words. Again, chapter Tap Tzadi Dalit, 494. Says the Ramah, after he says this custom to spread out grass. Okay, so everybody, make sure you go out, buy flowers for the holiday. Furthermore, he says there is a custom. Le'echol ma'chale halav. Le'yom ha'rishon shel shavuot. There's a custom to have dairy on Shavuot. Ah, and hence, the halakha that we all know, whoever doesn't have che cheesecake on Shavuot, lo yata has not fulfilled his obligation. <laughs> okay? So you must have the kalsones, if you're Sfaradi, Syrian, and the cheesecake, or whatever your custom is, everybody. Okay? Now, again, the, co the commentaries discuss how do we, how do we uh, balance the dairy with the mitzvah of having meat. You also have to have meat on the Yom Tov. So some people have meat in the night. Some people have dairy in the day. Right? That's what many people do as a compromise. Of course, if you're staying up all night and you need your coffee with milk, maybe you shouldn't have the, the meat. Right? Maybe you have dairy in the night and have meat in the day. Figure it out. But there is a custom to have dairy in the day. Now, what is the reason for this custom? Why do we have dairy on Shavuot? Different reasons, okay? Different reasons. And don't confuse this with the dairy of, of other holiday, Chanukah, okay? In the Chanukah, it was because of the enemy. She pegged him, she gave him milk. There was no pegging of the, of the enemy with a, with, with a tent with milk on this holiday, okay? Why do we have dairy on Shavuot? Many reasons. Reason number one. On Shavuot, the Jewish people got the laws. The laws tell you that you have to shecht. You meat, if you want to eat meat, you have to do it in the right way. Not a, we know kosher, by the way, is not just about the species of animal. If you go to a not kosher restaurant and order cow, huh, give me cow, I, I keep kosher. Hazak baruch, hacham, eating tarif. You can't just eat cow at a not kosher restaurant. They have to shech, they have to kill the cow in the right way. 
if it's kosher animal, but they killed it in a wrong way, even if they used a knife in a shochet, and there was a tiny mistake in the, there was a nick, the whole thing's no good. Throw it, give it to the non-Jews. You can't have it. So this is, this is interesting, okay? So, the Jewish people get the Torah, and all of a sudden they're given all of the laws of meat, how you have to shecht an animal. They're told about how you have to kosher it with salt. They realize that A, what are they going to eat right now? Until they kosher the meat, it's going to take them hours and hours. They're hungry. And also, even if they found a way to kosher it, how are they going to cook it in a pot? All their pots are not kosher now. They have to kosher their vessels. So the Jewish people, the easiest solution is to have dairy. Right? That's the answer. So that's why they had dairy on Shavuot. We have dairy on Shavuot. Beautiful. Okay? Make sense? Give me a thumbs up if you like that one. Okay? Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay. Very nice. I'll take it. Two for two. Next. Um, we have three. Hazaka Baruch. Keep it coming. Okay. Um, four. I like it. Okay. Next. Uh, hey, you already went. Okay, fine. Next. Another reason of why we have dairy. The Pasuk calls Har Sinai Har Gavnunim. What does that sound like? Har Gavnunim? Gevina. What's Gevina? Cheese. So we have cheese. Okay. Simple answer. A third answer. The third answer. And this is the answer that the Ramah himself gives. You ready? The Ramah continues and says, You know why we have dairy? He says, You know, every holiday had its own item. Pesach, we take two cooked dishes on the Ke'ara. We have the meat, the shank bone, and we have an egg. Why do we have two cooked dishes? Zecher, in order to remember the Pesach and the Chagiga. On the holiday of Pesach, when we had the temple, we would bring a korban Pesach and we would bring a korban Hagigat. So, so to commemorate those two korbanot, we bring two cooked dishes. Well, what is significant about Shavuot? We don't have two korbanot. What do we have on Shavuot? We had an interesting korban called Shteyalehen, two breads. So to commemorate the two breads, have dairy. Um, okay. Sorry, I missed that one. Go again. How does the two breads connect with dairy? So here's the Ramah. You ready? He explains. Because you're eating dairy. But one second. We know that if you want to have dairy and then meat, it's allowed, right? But in order to have dairy and then meat, you have to first eat in between it bread. Ah, so that's the answer. You can eat dairy, not because dairy is the goal. Dairy is a means so that you now have to wash your hands and your mouth and then have to eat bread and then eat meat afterwards with the, with the, with the next meal. So you're going to have bread with your dairy, rinse, and then have a new bread with your meat. And then you're going to say to yourself, oh, we had two breads, honey. Ah, the two alechem, the two breads in the time of the temple. And we're going to remember the shte alechem. Okay, Wow. Okay, so there's a lot of interesting customs that we're learning about today. Okay, so again, according to this, the goal is not to have the bread in it, uh, the dairy in itself. The bread is the the dairy is to bring a second loaf of bread after it. Okay, does that make sense? If you're having right now a dairy meal, and you're having a piece of bread, and then you're done with the meal with the dairy, and you wanna you wanna have meat, you wanna have cold cuts. You allowed? You allowed? No problem. You don't have to wait six hours from dairy to meat. Okay, some customs, some communities, if it's hard cheese, follow your community's customs. But in theory, if you're having dairy, you could have meat, but you have to rinse. And the piece of bread that you have with the bologna, or salami, whatever is your, whatever is your uh, chill, whatever you like, you cannot have the same bread that you ate with the butter. You gotta put that bread away and have a new piece of bread. Because it's very likely that the bread has butter on it, Right, so the bread you got to put it away and bring out a second. Okay, so that's another reason of why we have dairy. But my friends, there is a final answer I'd like to share with you today, and then again we'll come to a close of why we have dairy on Shavuot. Listen to this, my friends. This is remarkable stuff. The Midrash tells us that that when Moshe went up to receive the Torah on Shavuot, the angels actually fought him. Okay, they didn't want to give it to him. So it's interesting because when he was born, three months old, the angels fought to, f- to defend him, keep him alive, 
And now we see that the Midrash is telling us the other side, that when he went up to get it, they were like, oh, actually, no, you just shouldn't give it to him, right? Change, we changed our minds. They didn't want to give it. Where do we find such a similar idea, by the way? Adam Harishon. When Adam was born, God showed him oh, everyone that's going to live. Adam, and he saw David HaMelech was going to live for a flash, a second. And Adam HaRishon felt bad. So the Midrash tells us that he donated 70 years of his life to David HaMelech. That's why Adam lived till 9.30. A very interesting number. David lived till 70. Because Adam was supposed to live till 1,000, he gave 70 years to David HaMelech. Okay? Okay, I wish, I wish maybe I could receive also, you know, 70, all right? Adam, where are you? Okay, but David got 70. Okay, very nice. Um, the, the, by the way, there are stories uh, in our literature of people that have donated from their lives to other people's lives to add to their lives. As an example, in the time of the Hafez Chaim, there was a student very sick and the students went around collecting, not money, but time. And everyone donated, I'll donate a year of my life, I'll donate a day of my life. Crazy. And the Chafetz Chaim thought about it, he says, I'll give him 30 seconds. And they're like, what? Are you out of your mind? Rabbi, you wrote Ahavat Chesed, you wrote the book Loving Kindness, and, and you're only giving 30 seconds? And the Chafetz Chaim says, because you don't realize how valuable 30 seconds is. You think 30 seconds is nothing? You understand? Time is so precious, my friends. We'll never get it back. We cannot waste it. So anyways, the story is that told that when Adam HaRishon came to the last day of his life, God says, all right, Adam, I'm here to take you. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, 9.30, it's your death day. He's like, well, no, no, I have a thousand. He's like, no, no, no. You, have, you gave 70 to David HaMelech. And you know what Adam said? Adam said to God, prove it. Do you have a contract? Did I sign? Look at this, even 930 years is not enough. Okay, so he was, he was regretting losing time, Adam. And the angels of the year, I guess, regretted saving Moshe's life because now they're reneging. Now, oh no, I want to undo. Where's the undo button? You know, people love sending messages on WhatsApp because you know you could delete it if you made a, a bad uh, you know, message. As opposed to texting, you can't delete your message, right? So the angels start fighting Moshe. Keep the Torah up here. And what did God say? So we know there's different versions of how the story continues. But one version says that God told the angels, you want the Torah? You guys couldn't even keep a simple halakha. When I send you angels to, uh, to Avraham Avinu's house, remember what happened? They went to Avraham's house. The Pasuk says that he served them chema, butter, and meat. And God says to the angels, look, you couldn't even keep one law of meat and dairy. So you want me to give you the Torah now? You can't keep even one al You want to keep 613? Fascinating stuff. And so the angels said, all right, you can give it to him. Now, needless to say, this Midrash raises many questions, okay? Number one, number one, why should, why should one mistake, one sin of an angel, kill it now for all the other angels? Just because three angels messed up, you're going to ruin it for all the other ones? Not only that, not only that, but if you think about it, there, there were other sins that angels did historically. We know that according to some of our literature, there were angels that were sometimes ridiculing men for being immoral. And God said, you think you could do better? And he sent down the angels in human form and they also became corrupt. And they also failed to the temptation of immorality. So why didn't God pick that sin? Why did he pick meat and dairy? And not only that, but if we're honest, they didn't even violate a sin. Even if you want to agree that angels are bound somehow to halakha. They didn't even violate anything. The Pasuk says that he gave them butter and then meat. So first they had dairy and then meat, which you just explained, it was fine. And even if it was backwards, they weren't cooked together. Halakhically, from the Torah, it's only forbidden to eat it when they're cooked together. From the Torah, if you take meat and you add on a side a cup of milk and you have it together, no problem from the Torah. Of course, the rabbis banned it. We don't do it today. But 
I mean, maybe in the times of Abraham, it was okay to have them side by side as long as they weren't cooked together. So what exactly is God's problem with the angels? Says the Ra'al Bag, how does the Torah phrase the sin of having meat and dairy together? And again, it's not something that we're always careful of. So maybe it's a good time to start on Shavuot, to start preparing ourselves meat and dairy, to count the six hours the right way. What is the, where is the, what is the source of this in the Torah? The Pasuk says, Lo tevashel gedi You can't cook a kid in its mother's milk. So that's the source. Don't cook meat in milk. The kid in its mother's milk. What's very interesting is that the Torah writes this three times. And two out of the three, it's written in the same exact identical version. Okay, the Pasuk reads in, in its entirety. Reshit bikure admatecha tavi bet adonai elohecha lo teva shel gedi bahalev imo. Okay, what does that mean? Thank you, thank you very much. Bring the right, first ripe fruits of your land to the house of Hashem. Do not cook a kid in its mother's milk. This pasuk is written twice in the Torah, once in Shemot chapter 23, once in Shemot chapter 34. Same exact pasuk. And then there's a third time that it's written, not connecting to, to the Bikurim. But two out of three times, it's, right, it's written with the mitzvah of Bikurim. And I ask you, I ask you, what's the connection between Bikurim and meat and milk? Two mitzvot seemingly unrelated. One is to bring the first fruits to God, and one is to not cook a kid in its mother's milk, meat and dairy. And really, why is it phrased like that? What a weird way to phrase it, no? Lo tevashel gedi. Just say, don't have meat and dairy. Why well, you gotta phrase it? Don't cook a kid in its mother's milk. The answer, my friends, the answer over here is something, nothing short of remarkable. What is the goal of Bikurim? What is Bikurim all about? Bikurim is, you know, we live in a world of nature and laws of nature. And we drive to work and we get off the train and we start making sales and it rains and fruits grow and we eat. And you can very quickly go through life forgetting who's running the show. Sometimes we forget that God's behind the scenes. I woke up today because of Hashem. I wake up every day. I say, But if I don't say that, I can forget that God's the one giving me life. I could forget that the nature that I live in, the natural world that we're part of, is actually run by someone higher and above. And so, what is the remedy? The remedy is Bikurim. You know what's Bikurim? Bikurim is you bring your first fruits and you say, God, it's not my success. It's yours. Because when I'm a very good salesman, or when I have this new technology that's going to bring a breakthrough to the world and I'm a millionaire, I can very quickly start thinking that it's my brains and it's my connections to people and it's my prowess. And a person can become very arrogant. Bikurim, today we don't have that because we're not farmers, but you know what we do have? We have ma'asir. I'm not giving God 10%. God's giving me 90%. It's Hashem's money. He was nice enough to give me 90. He just wants 10. The person that has an attitude of, why should I give my 10% to Hashem? You're missing, on the, you're missing the point. You're forgetting who's the source of your bracha. So a person could take nature and it could become corrupt and lose God in it. Or a person could take nature and find Hashem. You could see many people. When, you know, I once asked my friend, let me ask you, when, when you know, he's a doctor, I said, when people are, uh, when doctors see the miracle of birth, do they not all of a sudden become believers in Hashem? How are there any atheists in a hospital? He says, unfortunately, all birth does is strengthen your former belief. If you believe in God, then birth will actually strengthen your belief in God. And if you're an atheist, then birth will strengthen your uh, belief in atheism. And some people are able to take the very thing that's supposed to give life and corrupt and use it to destroy. My friends, listen to this. Don't cook a kid in its mother's milk. You know why it's phrased like that? Because how does a kid live? 
What does a kid use for nourishment? A kid drinks its mother's milk. To cook that kid in the mother's milk and to terminate its life in the very thing that's supposed to sustain its life and to give it life is an abomination of the greatest nth degree. That is the message of Lo Tevashel Gedi Bachalev Imo. I guess you could say that physical life in general is like a mother's milk. The world that we live in, money, things, these things are like milk. And they can sustain us, but they can also be the source of our detriment. They can be the source of our corruption. The angels are very one lane. We spoke yesterday about how an angel has one mission, has one flag. Now the Jewish people were very jealous of that. And it's true. When it comes to spirituality, to know your mission is very powerful. But you know what the flip side, the dangerous side of that is that if you only have one mission, when there's no duality to your existence, when you come to the physical world, you know what an angel sees? An angel sees physicality. And an angel who sees physicality as corrupt. That's why when the angels come to this world, physicality only drives them lower and lower because that's, they're single-minded. They can't do anything else. It is spe- specifically because as people, we have this duality. We have within us the sometimes ability to succeed and sometimes the ability to fail. That we can do multiple things at once. Angels are single tasky. They, cannot, they don't have one, more than one mission. As people, we can take something physical and elevate it into something spiritual. That is the answer that God told the angels. The Torah, you guys don't belong with the Torah. The physical world, you guys will get ruined by it. But the Jewish person is able to take the Torah and use it to help elevate the physical world that he's in to a level of spirituality. So this is something I think that's really amazing and fantastic. But anyways, we spoke today about a lot of things. We spoke about the name of the holiday, Atzeret. We spoke about the custom of grass. We spoke about the custom of having dairy. May Hashem bless us on this amazing holiday of Shavuot to reap all of the beautiful blessings from the customs and the laws that are contained within it. We'll stop over here. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.